Good morning. Welcome to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. Today we have a special guest that we'll be introduced in just a minute. Before that, a few historical quotes or, or pieces of information that relate to today. On this day, back in 1943, was the birth of William DeBrie. And William DeBrie was an American heart surgeon who actually was the first to uh, implant a permanent artificial heart. You've heard about the Jarvik 7 into a terminally ill cardiac patient. His name was uh, Barney Clark, and Barney Clark lasted for about 112 days. He survived 112 days with the Jarvik 7. Later on, the Jarvik 7 turned out not to work well, uh, and other things have happened, but that, that was interesting. On this day was the death in 1915 of a German psychiatrist who admitted a patient to a Frankfurt hospital who was 51 years of age, and she had dementia. And about five years later, he presented in, two, in 1901 uh, I'm sorry, in 1906, in November, he presented to a presentation of psychiatrists her case. And somebody later on suggested that uh, Prenau's dementia be named uh, on behalf of this uh, German psychiatrist, Alois Alzheimer. And finally, George Davis Snell was born on this day back in 1903, and he was an American geneticist, well known before because he had described that x-rays can actually cause mutations in animals. But the reason most people know him was because he shared the 1980 Nobel Prize for Physiology of Medicine for his studies of genetic factors of histocompatibility. So he actually described the components of the major histocompatibility complex, uh, which you all know about, and that relate to the genetic makeup of all vertebrates. So with that, I'll leave you with Eleanor Leonard, who's going to introduce the speaker of today. It is my very great pleasure to introduce Lawrence Beck, who's going to give the uh, grand rounds today. Um, Dr. Beck, um, thank you. Uh, Dr. Beck uh, was schooled at uh, Princeton, um, Harvard Medical School, and is now an assistant professor um, at Boston uh, University um, in the nephrology division. Um, I am particularly pleased to introduce Dr. Beck because I believe that his work um, has actually ushered in a new era in uh, renal research. Um, in 2009, um, he published a seminal article in the New England Journal of Medicine describing for the first time a target antigen for the disease membranous nephropathy. Now, all of us you know, who have seen patients with membranous nephropathy know that this is a giant group of disorders some of these people have hepatitis B, some of them have lupus, some of them have cancer, some of them we can't figure out what's caused it. But in this situation, it would appear that we are actually beginning to be able to figure out in which situations, which antigens are important for the development of this disease. I'm also very pleased um, about this lecture because this work which was published in the New England Journal was done in collaboration with some of the individuals here at the University of Louisville, um, in particular Dr. David Powell and Dr. John Klein, who are uh, sitting over there and uh, contributed through their work in proteomics. So I'm very pleased uh, to have Dr. Beck. Welcome to Louisville, and we look forward to your talk. All right, let me get all the technical things turned on here. I think we're set. So thank you for the invitation. This is my first trip to Louisville. And we need to disclose a few, a few things uh, received honoraria from a company that makes one of the products that may be used in the future to, to treat membranous nephropathy. I receive royalties from up to date. And probably most importantly, I'm a co-inventor on a patent uh, that looks at technologies for diagnosing membranous nephropathy. So I'm going to start with a case that will run through this presentation. Uh, a 52-year-old male presents with several months of weight gain and lower extremity edema. Blood pressure is a little high, lungs are clear, and the only real physical finding is he has 3-plus hitting edema. Now, before you look at the labs, I've had a number of people in this situation who are sent to cardiology for echoes, 
sent for CAT scans to look for tumors that are obstructing their lymphatics before they ever have a proteinuria area value measured. So if you see a patient like this, remember to check the protein. So he had normal renal function, but his serum albumin was low at 2.9. Cholesterol was high. And on urinalysis, he had 4 plus protein on dipstick and a little bit of hematuria on the dipstick as well. So when you think of disorders of the glomerulus, <coughs> there's the nephrotic syndromes and nephritic. Nephritic are those involving inflammation, so glomerulonephritis, uh, inflammatory cells come to the glomerulus, pyelonephritis, interstitial nephritis. Nephrotic is something different. You can have a little bit of blood, as in this case, but essentially the, the main problem is you're leaking protein. There's a failure of the glomerular filtration barrier. So just as neurologists have their special cell type, the neuron, a highly differentiated post-mitotic cell, we glomerulologists uh, have our favorite cell, which is very similar and shares a number of proteins, uh, the, the podocyte, the visceral epithelial cell of the glomerulus, has this very intriguing structure with primary, secondary, tertiary processes that are important for maintaining the filtration barrier, which if I could figure out what they did. So between these little slits of, this, of these final uh, processes are slit diaphragms which serve as the final filtration barrier. And the urine that comes out from these slits is essentially devoid of protein. So the function of the podocyte depends on this, this highly intricate cytoskeletal structure that makes these, these slit pores. And the blood coming into the glomerular capillary loop gets filtered by pressure, and again, what comes out is, is the void of protein. So we've all seen these uh, EM micrographs showing the capillary lumen, the endothelial cells with their finestri, the glomerular basement <coughs> membrane, and these are the, in cross-section, these, these foot processes that, that wrap around the glomerulus, uh, the glomerular capillary, and between them, very fine filamentous structure is the slit diaphragm. And this is seen in a tangential view. This is the normal podocytes, podocyte, but we know that when these cells are sick, for whatever reason, they have what's previously been termed fusion of these foot processes. What it really is is a retraction of these cytoskeletal elements uh, to form this blob of a cell that then sits on the basement membrane and we call that foot process effacement. It can either be intrinsic cells, uh, stresses, there are a number of um, podocyte cell cytoskeletal proteins that are genetically involved in the inherited podocytopathies. There are extrinsic stresses, things in minimal change disease, membranous nephropathy, that can all have the same final phenotype uh, that take the glomerulus from the one that retains protein in the blood to something that, that leaks massive amounts of protein. So again, I think this schematically diagrams what's happening. So in cross-section, we have these foot processes. If you're looking down on the top of the podocyte, you see in the schematic view that there's interdigitating processes. But when you have a effaced podocyte, a thick podocyte, you no longer have these spaced foot processes, but there's this, oops, essentially fusion. But what's actually happening when you look at them is you just have these in the wrong button, just my big thumb. You have uh, retraction of the foot processes, a much simpler cell phenotype, and the junctions between the cells no longer have these elaborate slit diaphragms, and all the protein is free to leak into the urine at this point. So hammering this point home, again, this podocyte here can be stressed by a number of, of different injuries. So you can have the genetic injuries, um, we're trying to figure out how ApoL1, the gene associated with FSGS in blacks, does its job in the podocyte. But there are a number of cytoskeletal elements like alpha actin and 4 that can cause FSGS. Um, toxic metabolic agents, infectious agents like HIV can infect the podocyte. Uh, secondary FSGS is due to a maladaptive hyperfiltration in podocyte loss. But what we're going to focus on today is immunologic insults to the podocyte that can lead to nephrotic syndrome. We all know that nephrotic syndrome has a number of feature elements. Uh, it's all due to failure of the glomerular filtration barrier. 
causing leakage of enormous amounts of protein into the urine. This is the, the cutoff is typically three and a half grams, but typically we see upwards of 10, 15 grams of protein per day leaking into the urine. Uh, patients are most often edematous. They have low serum albumin levels. Because the liver increases metabolism of the number of proteins to possibly try to re replace the albumin, you also get an increase in apolipoproteins and hyperlipidemia. And in the urine, you can see these typical pictures that we see with the Maltese cross pattern with these fat globules are looked at uh, on the urine sediment with polarized light. Uh, these are fat droplets in casts. These are actually oval fat bodies, which are probably epithelial cells engorged with uh, lipid droplets. Uh, I captured this from a patient. So these are five oval fat bodies within a cast. So this is lipid urea. Now what's wrong with having protein in the urine? Well, particularly in the, in the nephrotic syndrome, and membranous nephropathy in particular, there's a risk of uh, deep vein thromboses, renal vein thromboses, and pulmonary embolism. Uh, edema can lead to cosmetic problems, non-healing ulcers. The cl high cholesterol can be problematic over time. Uh, there's loss of complement regulatory fac factors, and uh, patients are prone to infections. There's loss of vitamin D. But most importantly, there's progression to end-stage renal disease if this protein area is persistent. We know from the diabetic nephropathy literature that as patients move from normal albuminuria to macro, micro and macro albuminuria, uh, and the persistence of that leads to worsening renal function over time. <coughs> Similarly, in membranous nephropathy, for those patients that achieve a complete remission, so they, their proteinuria goes to under 0.3 grams per 24 hours, they essentially have 100% renal survival. If you get them to a partial remission, so between 3.5 grams a day and 0.3, uh, they have fairly better renal survival. But if you, if you can't get them into a remission and have persistent proteinuria, those are the ones that go and reach end-stage kidney disease. So what is the workup <clears throat> excuse me, of nephrotic syndrome? So if you have a patient with these features here and the clinical features of nephrotic syndrome, typically they get a kidney biopsy. If this is a young child who has an explosive onset of nephrotic syndrome and you're thinking minimal change, you might treat with prednisone and, and not do a biopsy. But in an adult, generally they get biopsy. And the major primary causes here are focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, or FSGS, minimal change disease, and the disease I'm going to focus on here, membranous nephropathy. Now there are others. Um, diabetic nephropathy can lead to a, a nephrotic range proteinuria. Typically doesn't have all the features of nephrotic syndrome. MPGN, typically caused by hepatitis C virus infection, can cause a mixed nephrotic nephritic condition that typically has more blood red blood cell casts, amyloidosis. There, there are some other conditions that can cause nephrotic syndrome, but I think the FSGS, minimal change, and membranous are the ones to focus on. So in this case, due to the unexplained nephrotic syndrome and a 24-hour urine collection that showed that he had 13 grams of protein, the patient is referred to a nephrologist who appropriately schedules a kidney biopsy. The biopsy report comes back a few days later. It's read as membranous nephropathy based on the IgG and complement factor 3 deposits in this typical capillary loop pattern that I'll show a few examples of. Uh, there's a note that there's no glomerular scarring. There's no tubular atrophy or interstitial fibrosis. This represents a relatively acute process that hasn't affected the rest of the renal parenchyma. So these are the, some of the original images. So this is from David Jones back in 1957. Jones was the one who came up with using silver uh, to stain GBM, mineral basement membrane. And this is a patient with membranous nephropathy. And actually, the black here represents normal basement membrane or basement membrane components. And the, the lighter areas represent the deposits, which don't stain well with silver. So you have this sort of spike pattern typical of membranous nephropathy and light microscopy. When you look by immunofluorescence, and this is for immunoglobulin G, you see these scattered dots throughout the glomerular capillary loops. And this is essentially pathognomonic for membranous nephropathy. On electron microscopy, here we have the capillary lumen with the blood cell. Endothelium is relatively unaffected, the glomerular basement membrane here. 
But on the sub-epithelial side, beneath the podocyte here, you have these massive deposits, which are interspersed by glomerular basin membrane material, which this sick podocyte uh, is secreting between the deposits here. And these are what stain with silver to make the spike seen on the Jones stain. And you can appreciate that this podocyte really no longer has discrete foot processes. They're all effaced. Maybe you're getting a few over here, but it's a, it's a pretty sick looking podocyte. Now, how do these deposits form? There, there are three basic mechanisms that have been proposed. The, in the 50s and 60s, when circulating immune complexes were in vogue, it was thought that you have a complex of an antigen and antibody, those get trapped in the subendothelial space, may dissociate and reform in the subepithelial space. There's some experimental evidence for this, um, but in humans, maybe this happens in lupus, uh, class 5 lupus nephritis, um, but there's not a lot of evidence. There's more evidence that a planted antigen, such as a cationic protein, hepatitis, uh, hepatitis B virus B antigen, is cationic and can do this. So it, become, it, it traverses the GBM because it's cationic, and the GBM is anionic, so it can plant here, and later on, circulating antibodies may target it. What we now think is important for most of the primary causes is that there's an intrinsic podocyte antigen, shown here as a red triangle, and there are circulating antibodies that, for some reason, form against the podocyte protein and later target the protein complexes that we saw in this picture. So this is what we think is going on in primary disease. In secondary, they're more circulating or planted antigens. And if you're thinking about how we would treat this, in secondary disease, you want to eliminate the source of these, these antigens or circulating complexes. So if it is lupus, you treat the lupus. If it's hepatitis B, you would treat that. But in primary disease, we can't get rid of the protein that's a natural product of our podocytes, so we need to therapeutically target the immune system. In developed countries, such as the United States, about three quarters of the cases of membranous nephropathy are primary in nature. I tend to use the term primary rather than idiopathic because I think we're starting to get a handle on what the antigens are and what, how this disease uh, occurs. But there are numbers of secondary cases. Lupus is probably the most common, hepatitis B. We also see it with cancers, certain solid organ tumors, um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can, can cause it, mercury, it's not a major problem here. but. In other parts of the world, skin lightening creams containing mercury have been uh, associated with membranous nephropathy. And again, the treatment for primary is immunosuppression. Uh, for secondary, it may be immunosuppression if this is lupus, but uh, we also want to treat the underlying process. So, same picture again. Primary membranous nephropathy is a leading cause of the adult nephrotic syndrome, probably 20 to 30 percent of cases of primary nephrotic syndrome are due to membranous nephropathy. Uh, diagnos diagnosis typically relies on kidney biopsy. As Dr. Letter said in the introduction, it's, it's not always easy to distinguish primary from secondary membranous nephropathy. There's another problem with this disease in the rule of thirds in that about a third of the patients go into a spontaneous remission. A third are left with persistent proteinuria, but normal renal function but a third will progress to end-stage kidney disease. And it's difficult to tell who is who. Monitoring, monitoring of the proteinuria is what we use clinically to, to figure out how these patients are doing. But as a measure of disease activity, it's a little late and it's suboptimal, which I'll show some evidence for that. So in, in graphic form, if you have a patient presenting with nephrotic syndrome, you really don't know which direction they're going to go in, in what sort of time pattern. They could quickly devolve to, spontane, to, to loss of renal function. It could quickly get better. It, it's very difficult to know at outset where your patient will be. So again, as introduced by Dr. Letter, uh, I use the term that the modern era of membranous nephropathy starting in 2009, but this really began um, back in the 50s when the histopathology was being um, known, um, Walter Heyman developed a rat model of this disease in the late 50s. It wasn't until the late 1970s that we realized that this model 
involved the case of a primary intrinsic podocyte antigen that was targeted by these experimental antibodies. And it wasn't until the 80s that we knew that protein was called megalin. The first human antigen was described in a very rare case, which I'll describe later, uh, in 2002. And finally, in 2009, was our publication of the target antigen in primary membrane property. So this was the 1978 publication done at Boston University. Bill Kauser, Dave Flant were on this. Uh, and what they did was in this rat model, they took an isolated kidney. At this time, it was still in vogue that the circulating complexes were causing this, these deposits. But they took a kidney from these, these haemonephritis rats, uh, perfused it with the what was called anti-FX1 antibody, which targeted the protein. And they showed that just by perfusing in a single pass system these antibodies, they could get deposition of these tiny deposits beneath the podocyte. And their conclusion was the antigen is a constituent of the epithelial cell wall, which turned out to be correct. So there have been a lot of studies in this rat model. Uh, the target is, is megalin, but essentially they're anti podocyte antibodies that lead to these deposits. There's activation of the complement system, which causes the insertion of the membrane attack complex into the cell, causing sublethal podocyte injury and a number of downstream effectors, which I'm not going to discuss in this talk. So it was known that megalin was the target antigen in the rat model, but was there something a similar or the same antigen in human disease? So people obviously immediately looked at megalin. In humans and most other mammals, megalin's present in our proximal tubule. It takes up proteins early in the, in the tubule, but it wasn't present on the podocyte. Megalin, for some reason, is, is present on the rat podocyte, but not others. So what was the target antigen in human disease? And this brings us to 2002, where uh, Hannah Debiak and Pierre Ronco in France, who have been very active in the membranous property field, described a case of a baby who was born with nephrotic syndrome, and it turns out with, with membranous nephropathy. And this was the first evidence that human membranous nephropathy involves circulating an antibodies. In this case, the antibodies were in the mother that crossed the placenta to the fetal kidney uh, and caused membranous nephropathy. This was a case that the mother was def genetically deficient in this protein neutral endopeptidase, had been alloimmunized with to the protein from a previous pregnancy. And in her second pregnancy, these preformed antibodies crossed the placenta into the fetal kidney, causing this disease. But because these weren't made by the, the fetus, the infant, uh, the disease went away after the infant had cleared the maternal antibodies. They found a few more cases, but this is very rare disorder. So we wondered, and, and other people since the 80s uh, were wondering, is there an intrinsic glomerular antigen in adult primary membranous proxy. So a circulating antibody that would target the podocyte here to cause the disease we know as membranous nephropathy. We have to leave. <laughs> so this was our technique. We took kidneys that we get from the New England Organ Bank. We sieved them to get human glomeruli. We made gel, uh, made extracts random on gel electrophoresis. And then Western blotted with patient serum either patients with membranous nephropathy or patients with other Maryland disease or controls. And what we found sort of mid-2000s was that we got this consistent high molecular weight band with the serum for patients with membranous nephropathy, but no other examples. Now, other people had tried this, and it turns out that the reason we were finding this is if you run the traditional Western the gel electrophoresis with Lemley buffer with reducing agents, you reduce this protein and the reactivity disappears. So when we ran it under non-reducing, this is when we started seeing this band. We tried purifying it as sort of a sticky protein, difficult to purify. We, we used lectin, lectin chromatography to partially purify it. We took the sugars off. We got it to shift in size. And then we cut out these bands and sent them to John Klein and Dave Powell for identification. And we got a, a huge list of proteins. The, the target one was way down the list. And we, we had a few other techniques that we got it to bump up the list to the top. But eventually, we had this identified as the M-type, or muscle-type, phospholipase A2 receptor. It's not exactly important what it does, just that it's on the podocyte. Uh, when we took recombinant protein and stained with a known 
anti-PLA2R antibody that we got from Gerard Lambeau in France. We saw this pattern. When we did the same thing with our patient serum, we saw exactly the same pattern. So this, this was our clue. This really was the protein in membranous nephropathy. So what is this? It's a large glycoprotein. It's expressed not only in kidney, but other parts of the body, lung, placenta, blood cells. Uh, it's part of a four-member family in humans, mannus receptor and some other ones that are involved in either antigen presentation or uptake of proteins into the cell. And it binds these secreted phospholipases. Our, our pancreas makes phospholipases to help digest food. The role of phospholipases in the circulating isn't quite as clear. And exactly what this protein is doing in the, in the podocyte certainly isn't clear. But in the initial cloning studies, this is a northern blot analysis looking at various tissues in the body. You see the kidney has lots of message for PLA2R. When we stain with an antibody in the normal kidney, we see these red cells here are all podocytes. They're the ones lighting up. We don't find it in mesangial cells, endothelial cells, tubular cells. We think it's relatively specific to the podocyte. And then this is a uh, diseased kidney, someone with membrane nephropathy. If we look at IgG or IgG4, which is the predominant subtype in membranous nephropathy, we see this fine grain there, capillary loop pattern. The antigen itself, because it, it's brought into the complex with, with antibody, we see the same pattern. And if you merge the antigen staining with the immunoglobulin staining, we get a complete co-localization. So the antibody and the antigen are in the same place in disease. We were also able to show that you could take kidney biopsy sections and elute the specific antibodies from them and show that those antibodies reacted with PLA2R. Only in cases of membranous property, not in lupus associated membranous or other familiar diseases. <coughs> so our findings were validated a few years later by a genetic study done by three collaborative groups in Europe that we're doing a genome-wide association scan in membranous nephropathy. These were all Caucasians with either membranous nephropathy or control individuals. And they found two signals. One was in the HLA region, which was appropriately mentioned this morning, uh, DQA1, class two molecule, and the PLA2R gene. And when they did the Manhattan plots for this, you see that the largest signal was here in the HLA region, chromosome six, but there was also a very highly significant peak within the PLA2R gene itself. And if you looked at the combination of risks, the, it was really driven by the HLA locus. So if you have homozygous for the risk alleles, you have 20-fold chance of getting membranous property. Whereas if you have the homozygous risk alleles for the PLA2R, you only have a fourfold. But in combination, if you have all the homozygous risk alleles, you have an 80-fold increased chance of having membranous property. Now, this is something we're looking at. We don't fully understand the genetics yet. I'm not going to talk anything any more about it now. But what I am going to talk about is the utility of using the, anti -P the PLA2R and anti-PLA2R system in the diagnosis and monitoring of disease. So in our case, the nephrologist isn't sure whether or not this membranous nephropathy is primary or secondary. And she requests that the patient be tested for anti pla 2 antibodies. So this is a, the table we had in our initial paper, very small numbers. Um, but we found that in idiopathic or primary disease, 70% of the patients had circulating antibodies to pla 2 r Whereas secondary disease, I think this was hepatitis and lupus associated. We didn't find any other glomerular diseases, no circulating anti pla 2 r and normal control individuals didn't have it. Fortunately, this has held up. Um, most studies show similar 70 to 80% prevalence and don't find it in any other glomerular disease or normals. There's a little bit found in secondary, which I'll discuss in a few slides. So how do we test for it? We, we use a very cumbersome method, and are still doing this, um, where we use Western blotting of either human glomerular extract, HGE, or recombinant PLA2R. And there's a little size discrepancy that's based on the fact that cells don't, in vitro, don't fully glycosylate proteins. Uh, so it's a little smaller in vitro. But this is the signal we see in a positive patient and in a negative patient. This is looking at IgG4, which gives a very clean Western blot. Uh, IgG4 is the predominant <coughs> form of anti-PLA2R. There are others. 
but just to make sure we don't miss any non-ITG4 subclasses, we always reblot the total. You can see it's a dirtier blot, but we still don't see anything in these cases. Now, a company has come up with two commercial assays that are available in Europe, are starting to become available in the United States, where they have an immunofluorescence test. They have human embryonic kidney 293 cells, either mock transfected or transfected with the antigen. And you can add the patient's serum to see if there's reactivity with these cells. Essentially, they have these little dual slide chambers. One of them is the mock transfected, one is transfected with PLA2R. And in a positive result, you see these positive cells lighting up because they're antibodies detecting PLA2R, whereas the control cells, you don't see any reactivity. The same company has also come out with an ELISA test where they have the human PLA2R on the bottom of these wells. You add the different patient serum and can tell if they're binding or not, and the, the level of binding, can get, you can get a titer from the ELISA. We've compared some of these. Uh, the Western blot is the most sensitive, although these very low levels that we can detect, we're not quite sure of the clinical significance of them. Uh, the immunofluorescence assay is similar. If we use the marketed cutoff for the ELISA, we get a lower sensitivity. If we do a, a lower threshold based on our Western blotting, we can get it up a little. But in all cases, we're only getting 60%. And I want to point out that Many of these studies are cross-sectional. So we're taking patients with a diagnosis of membranous. They may or may not have proteinuria. They may, have, may or may not have active clinical disease. Um, so in the studies that are out in the literature, if you look at the, you know, a cross-sectional study, the study from Germany here, they find that 52% are positive. When they look at those with active disease defined as greater than 3.5 grams of protein, they find higher percentages. Again, higher in active versus remission in many cases. So this suggests that the antibodies are present when the disease is clinically active. Another great technique that has become used by a number of pathologists recently is you can actually stain for the antigen in the biopsy section. So in many cases, the patient will be positive in the serum. And when you stain for the antigen, it's present in this capillary loop pattern. However, if you get a patient who you test the blood and you don't find circulating antibodies, there are two possibilities. One is that they don't have PLA2R associated disease, in which case you won't find the antigen deposited in these immune complexes. But you may find cases that are serum negative but still have evidence of the disease remaining in the kidney. So it's a historical clue that this patient actually had uh, PLA2R associated disease. Others have published on this. This was a nice picture done in Toronto showing the normal staining in the podocyte that really is faint when looked at with the antibody that's being used commercially. But what's highlighted is the antigen within the deposits here. So you lose it from the normal cell, but you find it in the deposits. And another uh, group in, in Germany has shown that you can stain normal kidneys, you don't find this antigen, maybe a little blush in the podocyte. It's enhanced, they call it, probably due to this aggregation of the protein enhanced in primary disease in the deposits, but you don't see it in secondary. So we worked with uh, Wei Song Chin from Nanjing on a few patients in, in Chinese patients with memory nephropathy. And similarly, he found that 80% of idiopathic and primary disease were positive. But he was also finding some a few cases in lupus-associated hepatitis and cancer-associated that also stained positive for anti pla 2 r Now, we would expect that as secondary disease, wouldn't have the association with PLA2R. And in the majority of these, you know, 19 of 20 cases here, 15 of 16, 7 of 10 here, there was no circulating PLA2R. When he looked at the biopsy, this isn't staining for PLA2R, this is staining for IgG4, which is also fairly specific for primary disease. He did not find IgG4. So this all suggests this is true secondary disease. In these five cases where there was circulating anti-PLA2R, he went back to the biopsies, and all of these had staining for IgG4, suggesting that probably these were cases of primary membranous nephropathy that just happened to either have cancer, older patients get both diseases. I find it a little more troubling that maybe there were ANA or hepatitis B. But I still think these were cases of primary membranous nephropathy coincidentally occurring with another disease. 
which may help us whittle down the, these lists that you can find. This is from the uh, KD, though, Kidney Disease, Improving Disease Outcomes, uh, Global Outcomes, uh, recent publication on glomerulonephritis, listing all these possible secondary causes of membranous nephropathy. I think many of these, sarcoidosis, hepatitis C, have been found associated with PLA2R, so maybe these are coincidental occurrences, and the underlying ones are really the true secondary causes. So, so we need to look again at all the secondary associations and see which are maybe coincidental and which may be truly causal. So, can, so I think we can use PLA2R in the kidney biopsy or circulating anti-PLA2R to suggest that a patient has primary PLA2R associated disease, <coughs> but can we use it to actually help in our treatment and monitoring of the patient? So in this case, the patient had his blood sent to me, which unfortunately is still the only way to get this tested these days. I think there may be a few other centers that, that offer this as a research test. Uh, the patient is found to be positive for circulating anti-PLA2R at a moderately high titer. He'd already been tried on conservative therapy, angiotensin receptor blockers, statins, diuretics. His blood pressure has come down to 135 over 85. Creatinine didn't bump much, but his 24-hour urine only came down from 13 to 9.8 grams. So the patient and his nephrologist discussed yeah. treatment options. So what are those options? Well, the conservative therapy I mentioned that all nephrotic patients should receive these. We have a uh, nephrologist at our center who likes the term either watchful waiting or tincture of time as treatment for many glomerular diseases. And certainly that's, that may be appropriate for membranous nephropathy because a third of these cases can go into a spontaneous permission. But for those that do need immunosuppression, the, the historically best evidence treatments are the Ponticelli regimen, which is alternating months of alkylating agents, either chlorambucil or cyclophosphamide, plus steroids, um, cyclosporin given in conjunction with corticosteroids, you can actually use uh, tacrolimus, another calcineurin inhibitor, as monotherapy without corticosteroids. And there's some data, some small clinical trials, some observational data showing that uh, these other agents may be effective. Uh, rituximab is not FDA approved for nephropathy, but seems to have the most emerging evidence. Uh, none of these are approved. Mycophenolase had some small studies. I'm not a big fan of it. ACTH is actually has an interesting history. It was approved by the FDA in 1952 for treatment of nephrotic syndrome. Fell out of favor when prednisone came in use, but has now been reintroduced by, by a company uh, for treatment of, of a number of nephrotic disorders. It may work. Uh, do not treat, unless you have a patient who's from Japan with membranous nephropathy, possibly children, uh, don't use corticosteroids alone because the evidence really shows that they don't work as monotherapy. Dan Tran and Toronto and his group have come up with a guideline for who should be treated. So the low risk groups are those with normal renal function less than four grams a day. They can be monitored on uh, conservative therapy. Those that probably should be treated quickly are those with worsening renal function, those with persistently uh, greater than eight grams a day of of proteinuria. You don't want to watch those for too long, probably less than three months. And if you can't get them under eight grams, you should probably treat. And then there's this medium risk group with four to eight grams. Uh, you could watch them a little longer, see how they do, see if there's any evidence that they're going to go into a spontaneous remission. But there are, there are risks of immunosuppression. Um, infection is a big one, cytopenias with uh, mycophenolate, with alkylating agents. Infertility is a big one in some of the younger patients with alkylating agents. Uh, cyclophosphamide, there's a risk of long-term malignancy, either hematologic cancers or uh, uh, bladder cancer. And with the calcineurin inhibitors like cyclosporin, we have the risk of long-term nephrotoxicity. But as I mentioned, there are the risks of not treating. So the big one is progressive renal decline. Other considerations in this case are what's going to be covered by insurance. Some of these newer agents are very expensive, and patients often have a choice of do they want to receive cyclophosphamide for their leg. It's a hard sell. So in this case, the patient and the nephrologist agree to use one of the, the time-tested uh, treatment options, cyclophosphamide and prednisone. 
And within three months, the anti-PLA2 or titers have significantly declined. And when tested at the end of this clonic jelly regimen at six months, uh, the antibodies are, have completely cleared the circulation. The protein has come from the 10 to 13 gram range down to four grams. Now the question is, what next? So proteinuria has lots of things that can affect it. It's not always the disease activity in membranous property. It can be duration of disease, antibody levels, what meds we're giving, either supportive therapy or immunosuppressive therapy with calcineurin inhibitors. There can be other diseases. If this process had been going on for a long time, there can be secondary FSGS in the kidneys. There can be tubular losses of proteins. We know that if you take the same patient and measure them multiple times, you can get quite different readings of the protein area values. When we do our protein to creatinine ratios, that's affected by declining renal function. So measuring the protein value itself, there's a lot that goes into that. Another thing in membranous nephropathy is that, and this is a beautiful natural history study done by a Spanish group, that it takes a lot of time for the patient to get rid of the protein. And probably you saw the damage to the podocyte and all the epithelial, sub-epithelial deposits, it takes some time for that to recover, for the podocyte to clear that, to, to reestablish its foot processes and slit diaphragms. So even those patients who are conservatively treated and a third of them went into a spontaneous remission, the mean time to reach a partial remission, remember this is under three and a half grams, was 15 months to, to get to this, this red line here. That's partial remission in here. Of those who had another 50 of those went on and had a complete remission, so under 0.3 grams. But that took almost three years median time to reach that. So it's very slow to, uh, to clinically resolve. And I think this has really affected a lot of studies, which, you know, a, a good study in membranous neuropathy is 10 years of follow-up, but many of them coming out have two years follow-up, and that's really not enough time to see what's happening. Plus, I know from personal experience, having tested these patients, that when you bring them into the study, and they may have five or six grams of protein, some of those are no longer immunologically active. There may be secondary non-cancers in there. So when you have these small trials, short follow-ups, heterogeneous populations, I don't know how much we can conclude. Um, the two years of follow-up certainly isn't enough to say whether or not this, immune, this new treatment is, is working. If a patient achieves a partial remission, are they on their way to a complete, or do they still have some immunologic activity? And the question is, can, will monitoring of the immunologic stats, possibly with anti pla 2 help with treatments, help with clinical trials? I think the answer is yes, but, but we're still getting there. So some of the associations that we've already shown of clinical status and anti pla 2 came when we showed that patients who are nephrotic have high levels when they go into remission, their levels drop. When they relapse again, which happens in membranous nephropathy, the antibody levels return. Some, patients, some studies have shown that the titer or level of anti pla 2 in the blood is directly correlated with the amount of protein area. And there's also evidence that the level of anti pla 2 is associated with clinical outcome. So in this case, the only significant association was they divided patients into tertiles, so low, medium, and high of anti pla 2 r If you had a high level, you were less likely to go and have spontaneous remission. If you had low levels, you were more likely. A similar study showed splitting the patients up. If you have low or mid levels of anti pla 2 r you didn't double your serum creatinine. If you had high levels, your renal function worsened a little bit. We've done some studies on this using rituximab, and I just want to introduce these emerging therapies. So rituximab is an anti-B cell agent. It kills the cells that are producing these anti pla 2 antibodies. It seems to work. ACTH uh, has been used in Europe as a syn synthetic peptide. It appears to be fairly good. There's one study comparing it to the cyclophosphamide regimen. It uh, shows equivalence in Europe. In the United States, we have a purified product uh, which is still undergoing very small case series. And, uh, there's one ongoing controlled study. Uh, but because of the, the lack of, of randomized controlled trials, these agents, the most recent guidelines for glomerulonephritis don't mention these as first-line agents. 
like a fennel aid again, may or may not work. But there was an observational study looking at the first 100 patients from Italy who were treated with rituximab. It actually showed very good rates of complete or partial remission over the course of five years, um, either as first-line therapy or as sort of salvage therapy, second-line agents. Showed 70% here, 56% remission rates. So we, working with uh, Fernando Fabenza at Mayo Clinic and Dan Petran in Toronto, took some of their patients that had been treated with rituximab, took their collected samples, and measured anti-PLA2R. And in many of them, we saw a decline and disappearance of anti-PLA2R following treatment. Here, so this is, uh, if you do it graphically, in red here, you have anti-PLA2R declining from 100% to zero. And what we noticed in all of these cases is that you see a lag time in the protein. So the protein comes down several months later. And when you look at it in aggregate, about a nine month median time for disappearance of PLA2R after treat treatment with Aproximab. But at nine months, the proteinuria is still declining. And this is what we'd expect from the, the, the natural history studies that even if you wiped out the antibodies completely and, and removed the immunologic cause, it would still take time to resolve the clinical disease. So just looking in at a, these few cases, those that achieved an immunologic remission at 12 months, 60% were in either complete or partial remission by 24%, 90%, almost 90% were there, versus those that had no immunologic remission also showed fairly poor clinical outcomes. We've looked a little bit about at this new agent, ACTH. We can see similar trends, although because of the small numbers, it's not clear that this is treatment-induced and not spontaneous remission. So I think the jury is still out on using ACTH. It appears to be effective clinically, but I think we need to see more data about whether or not it works for members of property. So I'd like to show this schematic. I divide the disease into an immunologic phase and a clinical disease phase. So some, somewhere over here, the disease starts. Something sets up the you know, is it molecular mimicry from a virus that induces our immune system to recognize PLA2R? We don't know. But eventually the antibodies will, will come up, the disease starts, Oops. you have high levels of circulating antibody, and you have lots of progeria. Either with treatment or with spontaneous remission, the antibody levels will fall to zero, but it takes a little bit longer for that progeria to fall. And it may go to zero, and that may be a complete remission, or it may hang up one to two grams, uh, and you call that a partial emission. So the question is, can we actually base treatment uh, on anti-PLA-4 levels? And I think that's the question for future studies. We, we don't yet have an answer. But I do like to use this, this schematic about, should a patient be treated? So if, if you look at circulating anti-PLA-2 versus PLA-2R found in the biopsy tissue, if someone is negative in the circulation but positive on the biopsy, that suggests to me that this is a historical remnant of the disease they had. So they're no longer immunologically active, but they have PLA2R associated disease. So probably you can watch them, give them supportive therapy, you would expect their proteinuria to decline. For those that are still seropositive, you test them at baseline in two months, three months later, and they're having a declining titer even without immunosuppressive treatment, I think you can also follow those. Those are going into a spontaneous immunologic remission. But those with stable or rising titers, you need to know what the level of the titer is and how much proteinuria they have, and then, then you can use clinical guidelines to determine whether or not they need immunosuppressive treatment. If they just tiny levels of anti-PLA2R with three grams of protein, I don't think I would give them cyclophosphamide. If a patient is negative both in the serum and on tissue, then they have something else. They're either the 20% of idiopathic disease that truly is idiopathic, we still don't know what the antigen is, or they might have an undiagnosed secondary cause like a malignancy. And those might be the ones you, you work up with the chest x-rays, colonoscopies, et cetera, to see if they have an occult malignancy. So this case resolved patient after this disappearance of anti pla 2 r was continued on supportive therapy, followed with periodic checks, and his proteinuria values declined to a complete remission, and serum creatinine remained stable. 
So happy ending here. There are cases where the patient can't be successfully treated, gets lost to follow-up, has persistent prognosis for years, and progresses to end-stage kidney disease. For those patients that get transplanted, membranistropathy can come back up to about 40% of the time. The higher numbers come from the centers that do protocol biopsies, like the Mayo Clinic. We tend to see overt clinical recurrence in about a year, but we know that as early as a few days after transplantation, we can already see the deposits uh, starting. And we, we've done some research, I'll talk a little bit more about it tomorrow in the renal brand rounds, that the presence of anti pla 2 r at transplant can actually predict whether or not uh, clinical disease, clinical recurrence will, will happen. And just final slides here, just wanted to show a picture of one of our patients who had membranous neuropathy of his native kidney, three years later developed end stage kidney disease, three years after that got a transplant. I met him after the transplant, when we were first starting to work with these antibodies, realized that he was positive after transplant, got some pre-transplant samples, that find he was also positive. Uh, a very early biopsy shows recurrence, he got treated with rituximab, didn't have a great response, still had some persistent antibodies. He got a second course, eventually but he got better, but I think that the biopsies are very interesting. So his, his native disease has extensive sub-epithelial deposits. A few weeks after the transplantation, he had positive immunofluorescence staining, which is the more sensitive test, but on EM, it was very difficult to find the deposits, but our pathologist did find a few little deposits, which looks very similar to the RAT model these tiny little deposits that find the form uh, below the slit diaphragm. And in the persistence of this anti pla 2 r over the course of a year, he develops much larger deposits in heavy, heavy proteinuria. To, this was a little bit, he went on to eight or 10 grams before he got better. <laughs> so I think there are many clinical implications of this discovery. Um, we know that 70 or 80% of patients with what we call idiopathic or primary disease have uh, circulating antibodies against phospholipase A2 receptor, which is an intrinsic protocyte antigen. The use of circulating anti pla 2 r or the detection of the antigen in the biopsy is highly specific for primary MN and may help us distinguish primary versus secondary disease. We know there's a clear association of anti pla 2 r with disease activity, being positive when the patients are nephrotic, declining prior to the decrease in protein area, being absent in remission, uh, there are a few cases where we've actually detected a, an increase in pla 2 r prior to a clinical we know that it plays a role in recurrent membranous neuropathy. So I think the, the role of this these anti pla 2 r in terms of guiding therapy and the use in clinical trials to get more homogeneous groups and actually see what's happening in response to the immunosuppression um, is going to happen in the next five to 10 years. And I, I hope we'll get some better studies about what the effective agents for this disease really are. And, and can we target our therapy based on immune responses? So with that, I'd like to thank a lot of people, uh, especially at Boston University, my mentor, David Salant, and all the people who are working with me in the lab. John and David here. Uh, without whom we would not know anything about membranous neuropathy and what PLA2R is, and some other collaborators uh, throughout the country and the world. So thank you for your attention. We have a few minutes for questions, so we have to answer. Thank you, Dr. Becker. This, this was a fascinating story of the detective work, no? having this entity and then identifying an antigen and how that has implications for what we do. So fascinating. Tell me more about this. PLA2 receptor, because you talked about, you, you hinted on biomimicry and uh, yeah. what turns it on and then what turns it off. I mean, it just comes on and off uh, without us knowing why and uh, makes it difficult to determine treatment because you don't know when it's going to be turned off. So what, what's known that you couldn't tell us during the presentation? The, <laughs> the, the molecular mimicry is just a guess. I mean, we would love to, there was a story in, in the Crescentic uh, Anca Associated Diseases about LAMP2 and how they tracked that down. I mean, people don't always believe that anti antibodies to LAMP2 actually are associated with uh, Crescentic RPGNs, but they found this protein LAMP2, 93% of patients had antibodies to it, and they, they figured out that 
they, they figured out that uh, it was very similar to a peptide, the, the region in that protein that um, was a fimbrial protein in bacteria and patients had UTIs before they got crescentic disease. We'd love to find a similar association with membranous nephropathy. Um, we and others are looking at the, the whole protein and, and figuring out what the primary epitope is. It seems like it's in the N-terminal region of the protein. We, we haven't yet made, got it down to a level where we can say, let's blast this peptide sequence and see if there's any microbes that might have a similar peptide. There's really no consistent infection that patients get before they have the onset of disease. So it's really a guess. Um, as for what the protein might do, there's some interesting literature coming out that it actually may be a tumor suppressor gene. In the, the first report came out in fibroblasts. Um, investigators in France were looking for proteins that, you know, if you take a, a fibroblast out of the skin and put it into culture, in a primary culture, it undergoes senescence. It stops dividing after 30 passages, I think it was. So they, they looked for um, short hairpin RNAs that they could put in to suppress senescence and allow these cells to keep dividing. And they found some clones that kept dividing after you put them in culture for up to 40 passages. And when they, they figured out what the what gene they had silenced to allow this, it turned out it was PLA2R. So PLA2R has a role in senescence. More recently, that same group has just shown that in, in mammary epithelium, that PLA2R seems to be important for preventing oncogenesis. So if they, they can only get RAS in, uh, to stimulate tumor genesis in mammary epithelial cells if PLA2R is not there. How that translates to what it might be doing in podocyte, I have no idea. True. Sure. Interesting. Cool. Questions? Let's start here, then we'll do that. So, so the slow improvement in proteinuria that occurs clinically, most spontaneously and with treatment, would suggest that we have a real problem determining how long to treat somebody with a specific agent before we know whether it's working or not. And so what are you doing now in terms of how long you wait before you say it is or is not working? And, and there's no there's no evidence to, to guide this, and I you know we're not doing these studies, and I, I hope that others will, uh, especially in Europe where this assay has been out clinically, uh, commercially. So what what I do in my patients because I can follow this is when I start someone on therapy, I, I look for a drop, you know, over the first few months in anti PLA two R titer, and fortunately there usually is a drop. And there's been some recent uh, abstracts at the ASN this year that showed that not only rituximab, but alkylating agents, calcineurin inhibitors, can all induce a drop in pla 2 levels relatively quickly. And those that don't are the ones that don't go on to respond. So if you don't see that drop, I think then it's, it's worth reconsidering a change in treatment. We know that people aren't completely resistant to all medicines. Some that don't respond to cyclophosphamide may work for cyclosporin or rituximab. So, I, I think if there's absolutely no change or if you're seeing an increase in antibody level, it's worth trying a different treatment at that point. But again, there's no evidence to guide this at this point. It's anecdotal. Um, something that you showed was uh, using protein remission as your marker for protein excretion as your marker for remission. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you have some long-term data, biorepository data, looking at uh, doubling up gravity or end-stage renal disease as a target rate point. For in terms of uh, risk factors with PLA2 levels or whatever. Yeah, with with this, I mean, because it takes at least years to to develop end stage renal disease and membranous nephropathy, and this this marker has only been available for a few years. There's no data on anti PLA2R and, and end stage renal disease. Probably in some repo repository data, um, there is that. We started. We don't have extensive collections that, that date back for decades, but certain groups do. And I imagine we'll start to see some of that data um, for harder endpoints, because you know, the FDA doesn't like proteinary as an endpoint, so we need these hard, hard data outlines. But you know, it, it's difficult to have these long-term studies, especially with emerging biomarkers, um, because it takes time to develop end-stage kidney disease. But it's, it's a very good point that we need to look at, at harder 
outcomes. Well, Dr. Bright, thank you for being here. We like to send our speakers back home with uh, something that reminds them about uh, Louisville. So we're sending you back home with a Louisville slugger. It says, Dr. Lawrence Beck, Medicine Grand Rounds, University of Louisville, December 19, 2014. Ah. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you.